Well, this he had carved out, did about 95% of the stonework. When he died, it was open to the skies, the walls were dirt, and the floors were dirt. Like there's a whole section behind this wood that goes out and goes down to another area. They used to lead to an above ground lake that's on the other side of the property that's already been carved in. But he hadn't done anything. No, what he would do, he'd work every few years. So people would be asking, well, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to open the restaurant, but I've got to do a little bit more. You know, I've got to do a little bit more. Anyway, to give you a little background on the guy, he was born in Messina, Sicily. His family had a wealthy family. And the reason he came to America was because in 1800 Sicily, the father owned everything. When he died, it would go to the oldest son. Well, his older brother Tony had joined the Navy, was out running around the world which meant that Baldassar could have worked all his life for his father, you know, in the home place. But when his father died, guess who got everything? Yeah, Tony. <laughs> he got all the love, yeah. So anyway, he decided to come on over to America where there was freedom. This is 1900. And he brought some money with him. But when he got off of the boat, him and his money started parting company and with the girls running around all the things to do in New York City. He wasn't long before he was broke. In fact, he's a nice looking guy. That's in the Depression years. So he decided to come out here to California. And uh, he kept, you know, how you hear about things. And he settled down in Orange County, and that's where he wanted to live. He called that God's country down there. Um, he would get up at dawn and go work for the farmers, like Lily Land and different things like that. But he said that what happens, he'd get up, <clears throat> work, make the money, and try to save some money to buy land, but the land to go up, and he'd work some more, the land to go up some more, you know. He couldn't save enough to get a big chunk of land. <coughs> so the guy sold him 70 acres in the great San Joaquin Valley farmland. And he knew we had some floods, but the guy told him, don't worry, this is high ground, because we didn't have Friant Dam in those years. So he buys it, gets here, goes to plant some trees, digs down about a foot and a half, two feet, and any Fredmans will know there's places in Fredman where we have hard pans. <coughs> yeah, that's why it's up on high ground. He knew immediately he couldn't plant any trees or anything. The guy wasn't ignorant. Like, the way, all the way through, he uses uh, venturis, microclimates, thermal siphons. Like, when he first started his stonework, he would use the cement completely around big pieces and small pieces, you know, whatever he had to work with. Later on, he'll use a little bit of cement, so when earthquakes come, there's room for movement. You know how they're doing on these big skyscrapers now, and they have the thing at the bottom, so it's over, so like that? Yeah, then also the high static pressure water won't build up, it'll weep through. But see, he didn't know that at the beginning when he was a young kid. He learns these things as he goes through. It's not like he had all this knowledge and was going to do this type of thing. Yeah. Where do they actually do his sleeping and eating then? Well, at the beginning, he did the cellar to get out of the heat. He had a house above ground. He called it a sweat house because they held the heat in. So he dug the cellar, and when he'd come home from work, like in the old days after he bought the property, he was broke, he would level on for the farmers and things. Well, in the heat of the day, he'd come home. Instead of sitting in the sweat house, he'd go down to the cellar. Then he'd get hungry, he got to go back up in the sweat house to eat, so then he'd put a stove down, then he'd put some shelves down. Well, years later, he would build a living area where he has two bedrooms and a kitchen, a fish pond, and a bathroom, and things like that. It wasn't like he intended to do it. What happened in the summer in the afternoon, he'd come down and sit in a cellar where it was cooler. Well, heck, he didn't have any television or anything to keep him occupied. So one afternoon, he wondered if he could get a tree to grow underground. No, he couldn't. He didn't have to go downtown and get permits and, you know, find this out. So he just dug out another area, and the darn tree he planted kept growing. So he figured, well, if one tree grows underground, two trees. Two trees, three trees. If he couldn't put his trees above ground, the roots wouldn't go through the hard pan. He'd put them under the ground then, you know, make a hole over each one. Huh. You know, just things, it's like in life, like I was going to have two children and end up with six. You don't really intend to do some things with your life, you know. And I never knew I'd spend, my, you know, the end of my life out here. Uh, I mean, of course, what the gardens gives me, I enjoy. Uh, and he would, he would enjoy that finally someone would come along to enjoy his work, you know, to, for what it does. So we've been fighting for now, what, since early 70s, trying to save it. And the people in downtown, a lot of them figured we're nuts because the property's worth a couple million dollars. So the highest best possible piece of land is no longer saving his work. And they don't understand why this old man, old lady, just don't go ahead and sell it. Now, if it was a business down the street, God knows what I could do, crooked or otherwise. You don't want to keep the money, but you can't do it here. I don't know, there's something here that touches the soul that you find can't do it. Turned out to be, she brought this guy, turned out to be a professor from London, England. He was doing a, a book on the history of the United States. He knew there was an underground garden in California, and he couldn't find it any place. And he went up to Sacramento and made waves up there. So I can see that all of the people down here, I don't know exactly what went on. But she brought him through, and he got really upset. He said, my God, this is an international treasure. What in the, is wrong with this town? Because there's just a little bit of his work left. There's articles up, and if I quote something verbatim, it will be in one of the articles, and it'll be highlighted. Because like I say, the place doesn't need any lies. But 1923 article, he died in 46, so this article was written 23 years before he died. He said, working alone for the past 15 years, 
The reporter must ask him how much he was going to do, because it said 20 acres of ground will be honeycombed. At present, more than half has already been mined. So more than half means more than 10 acres in his first 15 years. He's got 23 more years to go. Today we got four and a half left. You know, less than what he'd had that first 15 years. And yet as you walk through out there, it's like, God, how could he have even done this? You know, I'm still wondering, I got out of high school. I don't have the engineering mind like when the engineers and architects come through. I wonder how in the heck he even got the dirt out. I mean, I couldn't have done that. He's like at the top of the stair, you know, when you turn the stairs up there and you think you're walking straight. You're not, you're walking a little bit crooked, but he's got you in perfect balance with everything around you, so you don't know you walk crooked. So he does things quietly, yeah. Like when you come down the stairs, you don't come down one flight of stairs, you come down the three, so the Trinity's under your feet. Because when I first came in, I started hearing all these stories about all these girlfriends and everything. And at first I repeated them because some of them were from family people. And then two months later I found out it was a darn lawn. So finally I told my husband, I'm going to let his work speak for who he is, because just getting that dirt out of there, to me, is a miracle in itself. And then go down to the Hall of Records and find out what I could find <coughs> down there. When I went down to the Hall of Records and I found out, you know, when he died, I looked up everything I could find on him. I always thought this was a poor guy out here. Well, there's no money nowadays, but when his estate was settled, it was $40,000, a little over $40,000 that his brothers and sisters inherited from his estate. So the man was not exactly a poor man. He didn't have to do this.